Welcome to the Conversations with Jesus podcast. I'm Johnny Lehman, a baptized man of God who has the amazing privileges of being a husband, father, and the pastor at Divine Savior Church in West Palm Beach, Florida. This podcast is designed to bring you the self-sacrificing love of Jesus found in the Bible through 15 to 20 minute episodes that focus on relevant life issues and what God has to say about them. Check out our website, DivineSaviorChurch.com, as well as our Facebook and Instagram pages to find out more about the incredible things God is doing through our church family. Each week I sit down to record this podcast, I I feel this urge to just continually pinch myself. I, I'm the most undeserving person in the world to get to to get to do a podcast like this, and I can't tell you how how much I value the fact that you take time to listen to it. And I'm especially thinking about you moms this week as we approach Mother's Day. I, I praise God for my own mom, for my mother-in-law, for my grandmas, my grandmas-in-law, just amazing, amazing mothers who exemplified and reflected the living hope and the enduring love of our Savior. And that's really my segue into where we're going in First Peter this week. So we're shifting things around. We've kind of been walking methodically through this letter. We're going to jump ahead and then jump back with First Peter chapter 3. In fact, I have to be honest with you, in a couple of weeks there won't be a podcast. Maybe it'll be a separate one-off of something. But this week we are looking at First Peter chapter 4, verses 12 through 19, where Peter talks about how it's just not easy to be a Christian. In fact, we shouldn't be surprised when life isn't easy. Because Jesus said that would be the case, right? We need a deeper joy, Peter says, a deeper hope to live for, to make it through. And God in his grace, my goodness, Easter gives us that living hope. But don't be surprised by the suffering. Jesus experienced it too, right? We rejoice in it. It's proof you belong to him. So don't be ashamed, but be honored. We have nothing to fear about the future, but everything to look forward to. We are in the hands of the God who loved us so much. He suffered for us and gave his life for you and for me. So as we get into this this week, let's first take in these words of Peter from chapter 4, verses 12 through 19. He writes this, Dear friends, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal that has come on you to test you, as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice inasmuch as you participate in the sufferings of Christ, so that you may be overjoyed and his glory is revealed. If you are insulted because of the name of Christ, you are blessed, for the spirit of glory and of God rests on you. If you suffer, it should not be as a murderer or thief or any other kind of criminal or even as a meddler. However, if you suffer as a Christian, do not be ashamed. But praise God that you bear that name. For it is time for judgment to begin with God's household. And if it begins with us, what will the outcome be for those who do not obey the gospel of God? And if it is hard for the righteous to be saved, what will become of the ungodly and the sinner? So then, those who suffer according to God's will should commit themselves to their faithful creator. And continue to do good. This is the word of our God. To get our conversation started, I'm going to present two scenarios to you. Now, the only ground rule in this is you must be totally honest about which scenario sounds more attractive, okay? So here's the story. Imagine Jesus approached you and said, you'll be meeting a new next door neighbor in a month who will mock you nonstop for your faith. He will be a major annoyance and actually he'll be successful in petitioning your community to evict you from your home. But because of that, You'll end up living in a more beautiful house, surrounded by people who will become your best friends in the world, and through your witness of suffering, more and more people will come to know me. Imagine Jesus saying that to you. That is scenario number one. Here's scenario number two. Imagine Jesus came to you and told you the same story about how your next-door neighbor will mock your faith, be a major annoyance, and successfully evict you from your home. But instead of telling you how it all turned out, Jesus simply says, just trust me. Now, I can't see you, obviously, but again, total honesty right now. Which scenario would you prefer? 
If it were up to me, I think scenario one sounds a lot more attractive to see all the end results of why God would put me through something like that. And it's such a natural instinct, isn't it, to think that if we know the reasons, if we know the results, if we know why we're going through what we're going through, then we can have the hope of control. But is that, is hope for control, is that real hope? Is hope for control we long for or is it the enduring love of God that never fails? See, here's where Peter is taking us this week. He's saying that God has placed suffering in your story because he wants you to know love. The Lord wants you to experience the only pure love that gives you a home of hope. But to know his love, you must know suffering. Now, as you're processing that, is that uncomfortable to consider? That to know God's love, we must suffer? The struggle for us, especially in our cultural context, isn't whether or not suffering is meaningful. I mean, by and large, we as people do see suffering as meaningful. I mean, think of the expression that Kelly Clarkson made famous years ago. What doesn't kill you makes you stronger. Fun fact, she actually took that from the philosopher Friedrich Nietzsche, who, as many of you may know, has made a sizable impact on our Western society. So we tend to view suffering as meaningful only when it's self-inflicted. What do I mean? Well, we go to the gym, even though it brings soreness. We stick to a diet, even if we can't eat key lime pie. We study until the wee hours of the morning, trading sleep for a great exam grade. All these are forms of suffering. But we see that suffering as useful. We feel like we have control over it and its results. But when suffering surprises us, and we have no control over it, we, when we can't understand what possible good could come through it, it feels like an intrusion to life, which is exactly what Satan wants us to think. He wants us to see outside inflicted suffering as useless, hurtful, and meaningless. And so he wants us to be caught off guard and thrown into doubting God, which is why Peter says this. He says, Dear friends, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal that has come on you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. When your air conditioning goes out in the middle of July, which is a real, real problem here in South Florida, when your boyfriend dumps you out of nowhere and you receive a diagnosis you didn't expect, is not our first response surprise, shock, frustration, annoyance, maybe some anger? Regardless, it's not love. Because often in our sin, egged on by Satan, we don't say, thank you, Jesus, you're teaching me something through this. Now, to be fair, we as Christians are not called to be happy maniacs with a phony smile plastered to our faces like if you've ever seen the classic dog in a burning room meme where he's got the cup of coffee saying this is fine as flames are all around him. No, we as Christians don't look for suffering, but we expect it. And get this, we appreciate it. We don't dread the fiery ordeal of the furnace. We see the Lord's love shining brightly in the fire glow. For you and I to experience the home of God's love, our hope in life must belong to him alone. Because when it is, we are given a Christ-framed view of suffering. To see it as a refining furnace to remove anything and everything that hinders us from living in the warmth of his love. I heard a story once about a silversmith who was asked the question, how do you know when you've put the silver through the fire enough? And the silversmith replied, when I see my own face reflected, I know it's been through enough. It's pure. Isn't that exactly what Jesus does for us? This is the fiery ordeal to test you Peter is bringing up, that Jesus lovingly puts us in the furnace of suffering to remove all our false hopes all our misguided love, so more and more, his face is reflected in us. And in the process, we get to experience a love beaming with hope unlike anything else. That's what inspires us to, as Peter writes, to rejoice inasmuch as you participate in the sufferings of Christ. So you may be overjoyed when his glory is revealed. If you're insulted because of the name of Christ, you are blessed, for the spirit of glory and of God rests on you. In other words, we rejoice in suffering because we know the coming joy. The joy of Jesus returning to bring us home. This joy will lead us to do what R.C.H. Lenski wrote in his commentary. We will be skipping and bubbling over with shouts of delight. 
So when unexpected suffering comes by faith, we don't see it as a strange intrusion into our lives. We rejoice because we know the home to come. We know our Father in heaven loves us so much that he wants us to experience his hope to the full. And that can only happen when he melts away all the false hopes from our hearts. And yet I would understand that there's still a part of you that finds this truth to be unnatural at best or masochistic at worst. I mean, can you see the angle of Satan, our sinful nature, being exposed here? For Peter to say that we're blessed when we suffer in Jesus' name, it's the total opposite of the world's definition of being blessed. The world's definition of blessedness always has an element of control. If you have everything going your way, if you are in such control that nothing surprises you, you see everything coming, now that would be the blessed life. I call it the Sherlock Holmes view of suffering. If you've ever seen those movies with Robert Downey Jr., he portrays how Sherlock could anticipate every move and counter move of his opponent in a split second and thus always come out on top. But think about this. If you knew every move and counter move that would happen in your life, do you see how love couldn't exist? If you knew in advance everything a person would bring you by having a relationship with them, you really wouldn't be loving them for them, would you? You would be loving them for what they would give you. Like a gym trainer, you use them to better your physical health, but that's where the relationship ends. Or an HVAC technician or an electrician, you have a transactional relationship, which is but a means to an end and not an end itself. Now translate that thought to your connection with God. If God is merely a means to the end that we want, the story we want to control, we wouldn't know love. It's the lovelessness of sin. We don't love the Lord for him. We miss out on our true home, and without his love, we cannot have hope. And that's why we need constant reminders of how deep God's love is for us, which is exactly why Peter gives us an identity check with one simple word in Greek to start this section, agapatoi. All right, so agapatoi. Maybe you hear the word agape in there. The NIV translates it as dear friends, but literally saying loved ones. You who are agape loved, unconditionally loved, selflessly loved, eternally loved by Jesus, you are blessed because if you suffer as a Christian, Peter says, do not be ashamed, but praise God that you bear that name. And out of all people to say that, isn't it stunning that it's Peter? And maybe you remember a couple months ago on the podcast when we were going through the Gospel of Mark and we hear about Peter who, I mean, this is the guy, right, who rebuked Jesus for talking about taking up a cross and following him. This is the guy who, after Jesus rose from the dead, didn't want to suffer at all. What does he say? What about him, Jesus? All this suffering you say, I'm going to have. What about that guy? What about John? And this is the guy who wanted Jesus to keep all suffering away from him so he could avoid it. But now as Peter approaches his own death on a literal cross, he sees our Christian cross bearing in an entirely new light. He sees what it really is. We are given suffering because Jesus wants you and me to know the living hope of his love. He wants us to rejoice that his name is on us. On the day of your baptism, Jesus gave you his identifying mark, megaphoning to the world that you belong to him. The greatest identity, the greatest hope. Yet this closeness with him also means you can expect the same treatment he received. Like Jesus says in John chapter 15, As it is, you do not belong to the world, but I have chosen you out of the world. That is why the world hates you. The world sees us as strange intrusions because we reflect a love this world without God cannot understand. Jesus, the only perfect human being to ever walk this earth. Jesus, who always loved people as they needed to be loved. How could anyone hate Jesus? And yet he was nailed to a cross. But think about what his suffering accomplished. As the tremendous hymn, How Deep the Father's Love for Us says, How great the pain of searing loss, the Father turns his face away, as wounds which marred the chosen one bring many sons to glory. His suffering made you his own. It's why we rejoice in the guaranteed result of our sufferings. It brings you closer to the hope emanating presence of Jesus, your greatest friend. Think about it. The higher the intensity of suffering you go through with a friend, the deeper the friendship becomes, right? Jesus wants that with you. To enjoy the deepest identification with him, his love that gives you the glory of significance. 
The significance that not only will suffering bring you closer to Jesus, but you will be vindicated on the last day. Your pain will not be wasted, nor will your unjust treatment go without justice. That's what Peter is saying in chapter 4, verses 17 and 18. Unbelievers will first be judged on how they treated the household of God, and then they'll be judged according to the all-important gospel they rejected. And this is the love we have. This is the love for this dying world that spurs us on, that we live out the hope of Jesus, waiting joyfully and expectantly for the Lord to do what he does best, and that's change hearts. And with it being the week approaching Mother's Day, I can't help but think of a mom whose faith shined in this way. At my childhood church, this amazing Christian mom in her 70s, she would always sit front right pew of the church. And without fail, every Sunday, she would check to see if her kids came through the door. Sunday after Sunday, year after year, they never came. And when I'd watch her do this each week, I couldn't help but feel sadness. But as I think about it now, she was living out hope. Yes, these kids she had brought up in the Lord, shared Jesus with, worshipped with, never came through that door. Not yet. The suffering she as a mom went through, and yet every Sunday she had that same hope her kids would return. But that's what the hope of Jesus does. You have confidence that God can work miracles like that. It opens our eyes beyond the suffering to see the glory that we long for. Now, I only know from a distance the unique calling of a mother, the nurturing, the fierce love, the self-sacrifice, and yes, the empathic hurt when your child hurts. I also know that maybe for you, you never experienced having a mom like that. Or maybe you always wanted to be a mom, but that wasn't the Lord's plans for you. And that ache that remains, longing for what never be, I can't say I understand that. And yet no matter what your experience with motherhood has been, with your child of God, you can say you've experienced real love that gives you the certain hope of home. You've witnessed the nurturing love of God who has a plan. Who's had, he's had a plan for you from before time began. The fierce love of your Savior who went through the most lonely abandonment to wrap you in his arms, who chose to experience your hurt and bring you through it. And the Spirit who fills you with an inexpressible joy through word and sacrament. Do you see how your suffering shows your true significance? How God longs for you to place your entire hope and trust in him? Anyone and anything else we place our, tr- our hope in will falter. But when Jesus is our all in all, when we, as Peter writes in verse 19, when we commit ourselves to our always totally faithful creator and we deposit all we are in the hands of our cre- creator, redeemer, sanctifier, the triune God who will never go back on his word, who will never leave you longing, who will never isolate you, we place all that we are into his hands and we continue to do good. We suffer well. Because we know in our suffering, we know the Savior is there, that we're home. It's why we praise God for Christians who remind us that we are loved ones of Jesus. Especially today, this week, those Christians, biological or not, whom God sent to be moms to you. Those women who shared hope with you, reminded you of what we truly want, our one thing. What is our one thing as Christians? To know our true home. A home found in an operating room, a home found in a funeral home, a home found in your bedroom and your restlessness. What is this home that suffering opens to you? Jesus. It's Jesus. Only Jesus. It's in that space you bubble over with joy, even in pain, because joy is the only response a child of God can have next to him. Don't be surprised if tears start flowing because you now know what the only real love in the world is. That's living hope. Amen. The prayers are with you as you as you celebrate, right, this amazing Mother's Day weekend. God willing you the chance to thank again those women who made an impact in your walk with God. And on that note, I do personally again, I I think of my own mom. Um, to be quite honest with you, I would I would not only I've never done a podcast like this, nor become a pastor, if not for my mom's encouragement and the amazing friendship I still get to enjoy with her today. And so I, again, I praise God for those amazing Christian mothers that the Lord uses to bring his grace and hope to children and people all over the world. So God's blessings to you as you live for him and enjoy the riches of following our Savior Jesus.